Then I read Chesterton's Everlasting Man, and for the first time saw the whole Christian outline of history set out in a form that seemed to me to make sense. Somehow I contrived not to be too badly shaken. You will remember that I already thought Chesterton the most sensible man alive, apart from his Christianity. <laughs> now, I veritably believe, I thought, I didn't of course say, words would have revealed the nonsense, that Christianity itself was very sensible, apart from its Christianity. But I hardly remember, for I had not long finished The Everlasting Man when something far more alarming happened to me. Early in 1926, the hardest boiled of all the atheists I ever knew sat in my room on the other side of the fire and remarked that the evidence for the historicity of the Gospels was really surprisingly good. Rum thing, he went on, all that stuff of phrases about the dying God. Rum thing. It almost looks as if it had really happened once. <laughs> to understand the shattering impact of it, you would need to know the man, who has certainly never since shown any interest in Christianity. If he, the cynic of cynics, the toughest of the toughs, were not, as I would still have put it, safe, where could I turn? Was there then no escape? The odd thing was that before God closed in on me, I was in fact offered what now appears a moment of wholly free choice, in a sense. I was going up Headington Hill on the top of a bus, without words, and I think almost without images, a fact about myself was somehow presented to me. I became aware that I was holding something at bay, or shutting something out, or, if you like, that I was wearing some stiff clothing, like corsets, or even a suit of armour, as if I were a lobster. I felt myself being there and then, given a free choice. I could open the door or keep it shut. I could unbuckle the armour or keep it on. Neither choice was presented as a duty. No threat or promise was attached to either, though I knew that to open the door or to take off the corslet meant the incalculable. The choice appeared to be momentous, but it was also strangely unemotional. I was moved by no desires or fears. In a sense, I was not moved by anything. I chose to open to unbuckle, to loosen the rein. I say, I chose, yet it did not really seem possible to do the opposite. On the other hand, I was aware of no motives. You could argue that I was not a free agent, but I am more inclined to think that this came nearer to being a perfectly free act than most that I have ever done. Necessity may not be the opposite of freedom, and perhaps a man is most free when, instead of producing motives, he could only say, I am what I do. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for coming back. Uh, it was all because of the chicken, right? It's, a, it's such a blessing to be invited to fill out some of what I started when I was here last. I, I had a very disturbing experience after I spoke to you all. How many of y'all were here last time when I gave my little 15-minute thing? Uh, Greg Mott came up to me afterwards and he said, Lazo, I got a real big problem with what just happened. <laughs> you should have gone on for an hour and a half. <laughs> I said, come back in March. I got some plans. So I got my 20 pages here. I'll talk as quickly as I can. No. But I wanted to kind of continue to address the question that I had last time. What makes Lewis so imitable? What makes him so worthy of following as we follow Christ? Uh, and that's kind of where the talk Witness to Wonder came from as we examine Lewis's life and works. What makes him so compelling? You know that three men died on the same day. John F. Kennedy died, and an hour and a half earlier, C.S. Lewis had died, and Aldous Huxley, the author of A Brave New World, had died. Aldous Huxley, you only read if they make you in high school. <laughs> John F. Kennedy's profiles in Courage has dwindled vastly in popularity, and while there was a lot of hoopla about him, I bet you you don't hear a lot about him on the 51st year after he passed, or the 52nd. And it's not to diminish the influence of these incredible men, but there's a voice that continues to speak, that continues to compel people around the world. And that's Lewis's voice. 
So I wanted to look at what makes him so compelling, what makes him a witness to wonder. And as I did, I have to let you know, I've been thinking about this talk since, I don't know, November or something? Is that when we first first got together? And praying about it and trying to stay out of the realm of the feedback. Um, let's move this right over here. And I wanted to just to, to find a way to encapsulate. Now, I mean, I'm a guitar of one string. My friends can all tell you, you know, the how you doing is a, a hidden question. How, what do you, what's the latest on C.S. Lewis when they ask me? You know, it's, it's, it's a nonstop talk, topic. And well, Lewis said is, you know, an invitation to gla eyes glazing over too many times. <laughs> I could probably have walked up here and told, talked to you for an hour about the life of and work of C.S. Lewis just off the top of my head, but I wanted something to structure. I wanted to frame that up, and I, I struggled to find a way. I went back to ability and humility. I fought for a while about unpacking the theological doctrines of justification and sanctification. I would have talked about old cars and buying a dress and putting it in your closet. I could have gotten sanctification out of there. <laughs> I thought about the four cardinal virtues. I cast around. And then I have to let you know, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Our chaplain at Houston Christian, Kristen Binkley, uh, did a devotion a couple of days ago, and things locked into place. Another thing that, that locked into place after I prayed was... You know, in looking forward to the privilege of coming to speak to you, I thought, well, how am I going to frame this up? And I've got about an hour and a quarter, and how am I going to frame this up? And I'm like, oh, it's Houston's first Baptist. I'm doing a three-point sermon. <laughs> I remember enough of my Moody Bible Institute days. We got a three-point sermon, but then what three points? How could I possibly frame up the incredibly deep, wise, helpful life of C.S. Lewis and all his books besides into three points. And so tonight, I thought I would hold nothing back. I'm bringing out the big guns C.S. Lewis style. I'm not going to give you the four cardinal virtues. I'm going to give you the three theological virtues. You know what those are, right? Yes, you do. Faith. Hope love. Those are the three theological virtues. What particular insight does C.S. Lewis have to offer to us tonight? How has he, has he so grabbed a hold of my life and my imagination and the lives and imaginations of millions of others? Simply put, outside of Scripture, no author I know does more to help me understand and apply the three things that shall abide when all else passes away. Faith, hope, and love. But I hope to give you a little bit more, perhaps, than you have maybe a, a, a new Lewisian insight on each of these three things. I hope I can say some things tonight that maybe you haven't heard before. Now, you'll remember last time I talked about Lewis's ability, his incredible intelligence, his wide reading. Uh, I'm going to warn you, I'm about to curse. I just finished Lewis's Oxford History of English Literature in the 16th century. It took him nine years to write. He read every author from the 1500s in English, and then he read every author that had anything to do with them, and then translated those authors into Renaissance literature, Renaissance English, for fun, he wrote an 85-page bibliography of everybody that he had read about and read. It took him nine years to write. He called it the Oxford History of English Literature. You know what he called it? The old hell. <laughs> it was only one L. It wasn't really cursing. <laughs> the thing that stuns me is the way that this man, and I literally, I just finished page 582 last night. I got the 85 pages of bibliography to read, but you know, there's always tomorrow. <laughs> the way that he gathers all of this information, puts it together, makes comparisons, and brings 
disparate authors from disparate times together, and, together, and then puts together a, a, in a perfect example. It's 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 stunning the depth and breadth of this man's learning. If you read Narnia and nothing more, you haven't even gotten a twinkling of the man. He called this book the top tune of his entire decade, and all the others were just little offshoots. The other books that were offshoots were Surprised by Joy, Mere Christianity, The Chronicles of Narnia. These were all the offshoots while he's writing this enormous thing. A student recalls once having dinner with, uh, with Lewis, challenging him on his memory. Lewis sends him to the library. He picks out a book. The student opens the book, reads a line, and Lewis recites the rest of the act. It was stunning. The thing I think that's perhaps most profitable to keep in mind is that with all of this learning and his philosophical training at Oxford, he was a deeply committed atheist. And like most deeply committed atheists, he was also deeply scarred. His mother died when he was nine years old. He prayed for her to get better, and when she didn't, he said, I prayed for a miracle. When she didn't get better and, die, and when she died, Lewis prayed for a miracle. He prayed for her to be raised from the dead, and she wasn't. Prayers don't work, he thought, and he abandoned that faith with alacrity. And then set about to study. And he went to Oxford and he was he got three first class degrees. Now in Oxford, you know about Oxford teaching? In Oxford teaching, you don't take courses. In Oxford teaching, you don't read textbooks. In Oxford teaching, you don't go to classes, nor do you have teachers. In Oxford and Cambridge, if you are studying organic chemistry, you have a tutor. And you go to your tutor once a week, and you read your tutor your 10-page paper that you have written on the introduction to organic chemistry. And your tutor says, well, you need to read this book, and this book, and this book, and this book. And for the rest of the week, you go and read those books. Also, tutors and professors, both levels of, of educator of the Oxford system, give courses of lectures. So you need to go hear this lecture, and this lecture, and this lecture. And for, so for the rest of the week, you go and you learn. And then you come back with another 10-page paper. And you do this 10 weeks a quarter, or a term, three terms a year for three years. At the end of reading your paper, could you imagine reading your 10-page paper to C.S. Lewis every week? <laughs> At the end of three years, you sit for three days and you write everything you know. And then they rank you on a first, second, third, or fourth class degree. C.S. Lewis did classics and got a first class degree. He then did philosophy and got a first-class degree. And then he looked about for a job teaching classics or philosophy. None was to be had. And so he pleaded with his father, and his father said, sure, and funded him for another year. Lewis went back and studied English. And he did the nine-semester, three-year course, nine-term, three-year course in nine months. <laughs> He did the three-year course in one year and got a first-class degree and was a deeply committed atheist. He read everything he could to try to get away from God. And everything that he read led him ineluctably, unavoidably, back to God. This was the kind of mind. So when you have Lewis and the Christian Lewis, you only have half of the story. He became a Christian halfway through his life, after all of his good philosophical, theological, literary training was done. This is the kind of mind that he brings to bear. One of the finest minds of our generation who did all that he could to avoid the faith. Read everything that he could get his hands on, then began teaching philosophy, finally got a job. And he decided, well, if I'm going to teach philosophy, I better, had a, I better develop a philosophy of my own. And so he went back to his books and reread them again and really began to grapple with absolutism and idealism and all the rest of the isms and read all of the philosophy over again and, and, and considered every idea. Rum thing, he said, my friends, at least the ones that were legitimate, 
turned out to be Christians. I could forgive them their peculiarity, he thought. He began to find a tinny emptiness in everything else. He said in a private letter that was delivered to the Wade Center, the Marion E. Wade Center, on the campus of Wheaton College up in, uh, up in uh, Wheaton, Illinois. They have Tolkien's writing desk there. They have Lewis's writing desk. They have 2,500 volumes of his own books. And they've got the wardrobe, <laughs> the original wardrobe that stood in Lewis's bedroom in his nursery as a boy. And yes, I've gone in it several times. <laughs> and obviously, nothing happened. Here I am. I'll go up next week to work on my book, and you know, I'll try the wardrobe again. While I was there, a private letter that he had sent to George Sayer came in near the end of George Sayer's life, and he said in this letter, as nearly as I can tell, Lewis says, my conversion was an entirely rational process. He was reasoned into faith. Now, I'm all for Kierkegaard and the leap of faith, but I think that leap is about like this. And there's very good evidence for the hope that lies within us. Lewis knew that and becomes such an effective apologist because he tried so hard to think any way out of it. He did not like the idea of becoming a Christian. He says famously, in Surprise by Joy, you must picture me there in my rooms at Maudlin, night after night, the moment my mind lifted even for a second from my work, sensing the unrelenting approach of him who I most earnestly desired not to meet. <laughs> Finally, I gave in. I knelt and prayed and admitted that God knew me. God. Surely the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. This was Lewis's happy sinner's prayer. <laughs> He was backed into a corner by the only mind that he could find that was greater than his. It was God's mind. What I want you to know about the first of the theological virtues, what I want you to know about faith, is that it's not wishful thinking. It's not whistling in the dark. Faith, Lewis says, is coming to believe with all of your mind and all of your heart, and all of your soul, what's true. And once you believe it with your mind, keeping on believing it. For me, the problem isn't so much coming to faith. It's staying there. It's sticking it when all around me says, this might not be true. I'm probably just making this up. Where does it apply? Faith. Continuing to believe truths you once assented to. This is Lewis's definition. Lewis puts faith and reason on one side, imagination and emotion on the other. And I admit that that sounds very cerebral and it sounds, not to put too fine a point on it, very male. <laughs> Amen, ladies? <laughs> and certainly there was... There was an emotional man to C.S. Lewis, although like a good, you know, Irishman of his day, he learned to keep a stiff upper lip. But if you'd like to know a little bit more about the emotional life of Lewis, I can tell you, uh, this is an advertisement, but not for me, I'll tell you about a couple of interesting discoveries and books that are coming out. If you are interested in the life of C.S. Lewis and the wife of C.S. Lewis, <laughs> His wife, Joy Davidman, is about to experience a bit of a renaissance herself. Abby Santa Maria is a woman who, for the last 12 years, has been writing an original biography of Joy Davidman, not just as Lewis's wife, but as the atheist Jewish young lady who became a communist and the editor of a poetry magazine and then came crashing to faith. She called herself the most surprised atheist she had ever met. <laughs> Uh, when she found herself on her knees. Some suggest even that her account of her conversion had a lot to do with Lewis's structure of Surprise by Joy. Her biography, Joy, uh, is written by Abby Santa Maria, is going to be available um, this, uh, this summer. It'll be available in August. <coughs> There's a critical study of Joy Davidman's works. This is done by Don W. King. But perhaps what's most exciting is a couple of years ago, a friend of Joy Davidman's passed away. 
And in her basement, they found a couple of boxes of her papers, mm -hmm. letters that we didn't know, and shockingly, 45 love sonnets that she wrote to C.S. Lewis before they were ever in love. They end in 1954. He married her for the first time in 1956, and then again, in case he didn't get it right, in 1957. <laughs> there was certainly an emotional side, and all of this I bring up to mention one poem wherein she calls Lewis, my great Antarctica. He was a frozen continent, perhaps a frozen adolescent who kind of stopped emotionally developing at age 19, and she saw through it and made him deliriously happy once she got him into his clutches. <laughs> Faith and reason on one side, emotion and imagination on the other, and Lewis was not one to eschew emotion, and he certainly loved imagination. Faith and reason is how we come to know what we can hold our hearts to. Remember what he said, continually, continuing to believe in truths you once <laughs> assented to. Let me give you a quote from Book 4 of Mere Christianity, from his chapter on faith. Now faith, in the sense in which I am here using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. For moods will change whatever view your reason takes. I know that by experience. Now that I am a Christian, I do have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. Uh, you don't have to hide your eyes. Anybody else feel that way? <laughs> About Christian? Maybe I'm just making this. A, am I the only one? Or C.S. Lewis and I the only ones? But look at how Lewis does this typical Lewisian flip. Now that I'm a Christian, I do have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. But when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. Right? <laughs> this rebellion of your moods against your real self is going to come anyway. That is why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods where to get off, you can never be a, either a sound Christian or a sound atheist. But just a creature dithering to and fro with its beliefs really dependent on the weather and the state of its digestion. <laughs> Consequently, one must train the habit of faith. There's Lewis, by the way, slipping in a little Dickens reference. Did anybody catch that? Remember what Dickens blamed the ghost song? You might be a, just a problem of my poor digestion or swallowing a toothpick. Yeah. Lewis in Screwtape Letters warns his devil, his older devil warns his younger devil, make them unaware of the law of undulation. Do you ever have good days? And then bad days? And do you ever kind of snowball on those bad days? Nothing will ever be right again, everything's terrible, everything's awful. And then on those good days, it seems like there's never going to be a cloud in the sky. It's the law of undulations. It's how the human machine works. And if you're in a relationship with, well, anybody, you're aware of the laws of ups and downs in them, if not in, if not in yourself. Lewis says, feelings come and go. God's love for us does not. And faith means acknowledging and believing in and holding to the fact, the central fact of the universe, that God loves us. Even when I don't feel that way. Especially when I don't feel that way. When situations go badly. When I do something terrible to somebody. When my tire goes flat. When my freshman won't turn in their own. <laughs> when I'm sick. I had an amazing theological insight one semester at the Moody Bible Institute. I was getting five hours of sleep, and at that point I was taking ten. I needed ten, and I was getting five. My theology got very pessimistic that semester. <laughs> but then we had a few days off, and I got eight hours of sleep three nights in a row, and all of a sudden God was wonderful. <laughs> Frederick Beekner, in his amazing book, Godric, says, God's never gone. It's just men go blind. 
Our feelings come and go. God's love for us does not. Welcome them when they come. When those feelings help you towards God, embrace them. Think of it as, as good wind in your sail. When they go, and they will, get the oars out. Faith gets the oars out when the feelings go. Faith looks at the wind and sails by it and delights in it when it comes. Does that help? At least it helps me. Faith is holding to what you believe, and you need to know what you believe. Theology is a kind of symphony. It's not his job. It's our job. I just told her to read theology. Uh-oh. Let me cast it to you in a Lewisian metaphor, and maybe it'll help. Now you don't have to go out and buy a systematic theology and then memorize it and translate it into, I don't know, tweets or something. But Lewis encourages us to train up our minds. The theological virtue of prudence is to be as smart as you can. Lewis says that God wants a child's heart, but a grown-up's head. Read more. Turn off the TV. Do you like my white and gold vest? <laughs> How much time do I dither away? We must be deliberate about training up our minds. So let me give you just a little insight into theology from Lewis's metaphor. If I am standing on a beach, I have a perspective of the beach and of the ocean. If I were to write down everything that I see on that beach, I'd have a little account. If my friend Jacqueline were to stand uh, two miles down the beach and write down her account, that'd be great. And if her husband Blake got in a boat and went across the sea and described his journey, and if you all took journeys across the sea or stood there on the beach and described what you wrote, excellent. If you compile all of that, we'd have a pretty good map of the ocean. And that's how we developed maps before we had satellites. Right? You described what you saw. Theology is the compilation of thousands of people over thousands of years writing down what they've seen about God. So lean into some of that. I'm sure you could probably recommend some good theological, theologically sound books. Might not be a bad Lenten practice, even if you don't do Lent. <laughs> a child's heart, but a grown-up's head. Be as smart as you can. Now, I'm not dissing TV. I don't even have a TV, and I know everything that happened on The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> it was the news story of the day on our school announcements. I don't know how that qualifies as news, but, you know, there you go. What I mean is let's be deliberate about what we do. And I tell my students, oh, I'm a terrible, terrible man. They're going on spring break tomorrow. After, at the end of the day tomorrow, I've given every one of my students homework over spring break. You may hiss and boo now. They have to read for 30 minutes every day. You may hiss and boo even louder now. Oh, and my students hate to read. I made them do homework beforehand. I made them go ask a faculty member, another adult, and a peer for book recommendations. They have to read for 30 minutes every day. But they are only allowed to read something that they love. And it's amazing what I get when I do their time drives at the end of spring break, when I require them to love their books. I had one little girl, perhaps not my greatest of all students, not my most committed, and certainly didn't really enjoy reading, but she was encouraged to do this. And she came back from her vacation. She went with a couple of her friends, and she came back from spring break. She's like, Mr. Puzzle, it's crazy. I, every time I was out, I kept wanting to go back to the hotel and watch the next episode of the show that I was watching. And, in fact, there was really a lot of effort to get me out of the hotel. My friends had to come drag me out of the hotel. It wasn't a TV show. It was a book. And the hotel was in Maui. I tell my students... And it, you know, all day here is this. But I tell them, 
that Netflix is the Iliad without electricity. <laughs> Before there were movies, there were these books. And the reason why I'm making them read 400-year-old Shakespeare, 2,800-year-old mythology, is not because it's old. I can find old and boring really fast. It's because it's good. Read a little more. Train up your mind. My nurse friend tells me to turn off all screens an hour and a half before I go to bed, but I still want to be entertained, and so I read. Learn more. Train your mind. That will help you know how to think well enough so that when the law of undulations proves true, and when the storms come, and when the doubts come, you can hold to, mentally assent to, hang on to the things that you knew when you were convinced that they were true. That's what Lewis calls faith. Okay? So, what's next? Which faileth not. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Hope is the essence of things, or faith is the essence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Lewis says about hope that hope is heaven. Charlie Peacock, the songwriter, he wrote, uh, did he write Baby Baby? He did some songs for Amy Grant. He's been uh, producing records forever. Um, Charlie Peacock has a song that says, I want to live like heaven is a real place. Are you living like heaven is a real place? Ultimately, heaven is our hope. And heaven means him. Heaven means home. That's our hope, <laughs> that there's more to it than this. It doesn't everything inside of you whisper that that's true, that there must be more to it than this. And of course there is. Now, I'm going to take on Bill Gaither now. Any Bill Gaither fans in the house? <laughs> Bill Gaither and the Bill Gaither Quartet says, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. C.S. Lewis says, Baldabash. <laughs> if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves, who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so effective in this. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. Aim for heaven. Pull heaven down. Remember what screw tape tells us about fear and guilt, the past, the present, and the future. Screw tape wants us to be thinking about the past. That's where guilt lives. We can't do anything about the past. We can, thanks be to God, do something about guilt. The future is where anxiety or fear lives. We can't do anything about the future, unless you have a DeLorean. <laughs> we can, however, do something about fear. Lewis says that now, the present moment, now is the place where time meets eternity. Screwtape wants us to think about the past or the future. God wants us to think about right now, and eternity. And by eternity, he really means heaven. heaven. And by heaven, he means <laughs> okay. Think about right now. Think about eternity. By the way, it seems to me in my own experience that fear and guilt work in exactly the same way. When I'm running from them, not wanting to face them, they cast a pretty long shadow. You ever felt guilty about something? Somebody you did wrong and they just started to haunt your dreams and it just kept bugging you and then every time they looked at you, you were sure they were thinking exactly what you had done to them 
Anybody else? You know what I'm talking about? Oh my gosh. Fear, the same thing. Has fear ever interrupted your sleep? Anxiety, worry, stress, right? Anxiousness. They work the same way. They chase us from behind. The job for us is to stop and turn and look at what I feel guilty about. Either one of two things is the, is the case. I've either done somebody wrong, I've done something that I shouldn't have done, or maybe it's just a false guilt or false fear, and I really did the best that I could, and that was just more than enough. Well, if it was fine what I did, then no reason to feel guilty about it. If I did somebody wrong, repent. And if I read my you know, Beatitudes, read my Sermon on the Mount correctly, repent before you go to church next time, right? Do it, take care of your business, and by the way, this is not Lewis, this is a little Wazo logic here. When you ask for forgiveness, I encourage you to do exactly that. I tell this to my students all the time, and I try to practice it myself. When I've offended somebody, what are, how do we apologize? We say, I'm sorry, I apologize. I never meant to do that. Right? Hmm. Give you a little Greek lesson. Apologia, apologia, what does it mean? Apologetics, defense. I'm literally saying when I say I apologize, I defend myself. When I say I'm sorry after I have offended you, I did you wrong, now I'm going to tell you how badly I feel about it. So that you'll feel badly for it. It seems a little manipulative and certainly self-centered. Perhaps the way to deal with guilt is to look somebody in the eye and say, I did this. Will you forgive me? And leave the question hanging in the air. They may say no. But at least you have repented and done all that you could. And more often than not, grace comes in. It makes a space to lay yourself out and to let grace work. And they might not say, I forgive you right now. Some wounds won't run deep. Don't think I don't know. But at least opens it up. And maybe the forgiveness will come in a day or a year or ten. God's forgiveness, thanks to God, is always there right now. If he has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, if he throws them in the sea of forgetfulness, maybe our sins are the only thing that we remember that God does not. Repent of a sin. Don't do it anymore. But then let it go. Let that past become the shining path towards heaven that we are all walking upon. <clears throat> Let it be like the marks in Christ's own body. He paid for that. Let him have it. And of course, the future, the fears work just the same way. Turn around. Look at what you're afraid of. Remember who you belong to. Remember that he exalts over us with singing. Remember that underneath are the everlasting arms. Remember that Jesus said, all the Father has given to me will come to me, and no one can take them out of my hands. Nobody can take you out of God's hands. I've got news for you. That includes you. You cannot take yourself out of his hands. But I feel so guilty. Of course you do. It's the law of undulations. Go back to what you know is true. It's in the scriptures. And if you need to know about the love of God, open up the Psalms just about anywhere. If you get more than a page and a half you, 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 without hearing about steadfast love, has said you're reading the wrong translation. <laughs> no, any translation, it'll be there. Remind yourself of the eternal realities that you know are true, upon which you have based your life. Lewis is a testament to this. Faith and hope. Hope is a whisper of wind from a far off country. Tolkien, Lewis's great friend, would describe this longing for a home in heaven as joy, joy beyond the walls of this world, poignant as grief. But it was actually our chaplain, Kirsten Binkley who, without even knowing it, gave me the real insight to hope that I wanted to bring to you tonight. I got permission from her. And how hope connects with Lewis. 
She spoke of hope during her recent, recent devotional while she was reading Psalm 40, or, or, I'm sorry, Isaiah 40, 31 from the NIV. You know the passage in Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and will not faint, right? They that wait upon the Lord. <coughs> Except she read the NIV, and I had never heard of it as I was working my way around how to speak to you tonight. NIV says those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Light went on. Hope means waiting. Hope means holding on to something that is not there. Hope and waiting have everything to do with what Lewis calls longing. Joy. The German is Zenzucht. There won't be a German course. <laughs> Elsewhere, Lewis calls it having and wanting. Joy, it's this stab of feeling. And there are those great moments that are full of joy. But then the second best moments to the actual having is when that moment passes, wanting to be back in that moment. Wanting to be back with that person. Going to a great concert or a great dinner party or a great anything. Wasn't that great? And then thinking about how great it was is better than anything else except for experiencing it again. But it's so hard to experience it again. Wanting that depth of experience, that pang of lack, the waiting, the hoping, it's what Lewis calls joy. These are those great moments, you know them, with the people you love best, the places you love best, and ah, the food, oh, the food. I got to cook a curry at C.S. Lewis's house last summer for all the neighbors. And then I got to go talk to the Woodlands Christian Academy. Their kids are on spring break, and yesterday they got to visit the kilns. And they were they, they posted it on Instagram, and they were all saying, look, that's where Mr. Lazo cooked the curry. <laughs> Shorter pictures. Food. I don't know about you, but when I was a member of Pioneer Baptist Church, we were deeply committed to misreading St. Paul, where he says... I buffet my body. <laughs> I became a Baptist because of donuts. <laughs> I wish I were kidding. My friend Wendy Einer invited me to her dad's church, and we had these morning exercises every morning, except on daylight savings time twice a year. Instead of having morning exercises, they had donuts. My first day in church ever as a Christian was donut day. I'm like, I'm coming back here. I had to look on my face the next week. Not only did I not gain another hour, there were no donuts. I had to wait six more months for donuts. But I had donuts to eat that you know not of. <laughs> but in talking about food, I digress. Or maybe not. Is not food a great moment of joy? Isn't there not waiting for the meal to be done? How much do you miss the cooking of someone who's now gone on to glory? Mm. Wistfulness, absence, something so good that the only thing better than having it is missing it, wanting it. Mm. The memory of joy is better than any alternate satisfaction. And if you don't think this too terribly strange, let me suggest that grief is a brand of joy. I want my father back. It's not going to happen. He's beneath a slab of stone in southern Spain. But the wanting him, the remembering him, the wearing of his ring, the seeing him in the faces of my brothers, it's a poor second best, but it's better than any other substitute. Missing my dad is better than any other man that's alive right now. It's joy. Because go back to what your faith has once assented to. You know that there is a sweet by and by. You know that this life is four score years and ten. Or three score years and ten. And then the reunification. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I'd like to settle once and for all whether or not there will be cats or dogs. Will there be pets in heaven? <laughs> 
there will be all things that we love in such a way that we could never miss anything because he will wipe away our tears. And he's been, he's been keeping those in his bottle. A friend of mine recently, yesterday, just lost her dog, and she said, why don't dogs live as long as we do? And I almost answered her back so that we can learn in a little how to grieve, how to long, how to remember. Hope. How to hope for heaven. It's joy. It's the longing for our true city. That city with the true found, the foundations. But heaven, that city, Christ himself, our light, that's so far off and so long to wait for. Open up your Bible and look at the word wait. Pull out your Strong's Exhaustive Concordance or pull up a, do a little word search on your iPad or whatever. Look up the words waiting, waiting for the Lord. It is our lot to wait. Might as well, in hope, make waiting prayer. And in this way, in the way that we wait, in the way that we hope, in the way that we know that this is not our world, in the way that 21 Coptic martyrs kneel down and give up their lives, the name of our Lord on their lips. But more than that, sacrifice. The way that one brother says thank you to ISIS, for allowing that tape to still include the name of Jesus. He thanks his brother's murderers for allowing their Lord to be praised. If Christianity is a real, I don't know what is. And I don't know any other religion that can do that. That's the real thing. Oh, may I be found like the brother or the brother in that day. Because of the hope that lies within us. And remember what 1 Peter 3, 15b says. Yes, you have that memorized? Always be prepared to give to anyone an answer for the hope that is within you. But with gentleness and respect. Do you know, did you see how those three, the, the three theological virtues are there? Always be prepared. Faith, knowledge, know, reason, do, the, do your work, think well, think as well as you can. Always be prepared to give to any man an answer for the hope that is within you. Heaven, him, one day. But always with gentleness and respect. When you treat, when you speak to somebody about the hope, make sure that you do it in. We're getting there. We got a good crowd. Come on, that. In this way, in the way that we hope, in the way that we long, in the way that we embrace the emptiness, and look for the fulfillment. Fulfillment. This is the way that we witness to wonders that we have not seen. But take heart, because our Lord has promised to us a blessing in doing just that, in witnessing to wonders that we have not seen. It's John 20, 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's not the disciples, friends. There's a blessing they never got. You remember what John said, what we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands as we proclaim to you. But we will do greater things. Our faith in some ways is bigger. We didn't see him raised from the dead. We just assent to it. And if you think through the resurrection, that's the only thing that could have happened to the body. It makes the best rational sense. So hold to that and then live your life as if the resurrection is true. Treat it every morning as a little resurrection. Treat every class, no matter how hard the one before has been, as another new day, another new start. Some schools of wisdom that I love say that it's never too, too late to start your day again. Sing to the Lord a new song. Psalm 137, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? With hope and loud. <coughs> oh my goodness. In the liturgical tradition, I'm going from teaching the Baptist on, on Wednesday night. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to our fine arts block. Our choir and our orchestra is going to Austria and Germany for spring break. And they are going to sing Haydn's Misa Brevis in F. It's this beautiful mass. It's gorgeous. And it's a little short mass. They're going to sing Haydn in Haydn's hometown. 
and they're singing the mass in Latin, and they don't speak Latin, but I do. <laughs> and I've participated in worship that embraces the mass, and so I'm going to go home from this tonight, and I'm going to finish writing out my slides to explain to them what Agnus Dei Quitolet Peccatum Mundum, the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. And I'm going to hope to lean into them and say, when you sing that, some people are listening just for the hiding. Some people are listening just for entertainment. Some people just want to marvel that Americans aren't, you know, chewing gum or something. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people in the crowd are going to be worshiping. That's how 1.2 billion Catholics worship, is through the Mass. There's a part of the Mass called the Sursum Corda. It's that part in the Mass where we say, lift up your hearts. And everybody says, we lift them up to the Lord. It's the way in the liturgical service we fulfill Paul's command in Philippians 4.4. 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Yes. Paul doesn't very often repeat himself, does he? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice as if you were listening the first time. You probably weren't. And as if. Rejoicing is an act of the will, not an act of the emotion. It is. I am not denying the great sadness that can overcome a person. My faculty at Houston Christian, we have lost, I don't know, maybe a dozen parents amongst us in, in the three years that I've been there, and I contributed to myself. I am not denying the reality of grief and and all the ways of brokenness that the enemy shatters this world with, the persistence of the thorn in this world. No, no. My best life now is sometimes a very sad life. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Thank you, Lord. I have come that you have life and have it in abundance. Have it abundantly, right? More abundantly. But sometimes that abundance is pain. Thanks be to God. We've got all kinds of examples of how pain gets turned to gold. Mary was pierced by a sword and treasured up those things in her heart. That's why the artists were so taken with that, her holding her son in her arms, and they've made the pieta out of that. In this world, there will be trouble. Amen? Lift up your hearts, and you say, we lift them up to the Lord. You want to try? <laughs> lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. All the more when you don't believe it. Especially when you don't believe it. Let your mouth confess things that your life will prove true. Because he is faithful. And will not let you be tested beyond what you are able to bear. The scriptures promise. Hope. Not wishful thinking. Not, you know, pie in the sky and a sweet by and by. Think about hope as waiting for something that you know for sure is coming. Christmas. Right? Any accident why Lewis chose Christmas in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? And remember how he described Father Christmas? He was so big and so glad and so real that the children became very quiet. They felt quite solemn, but also glad. Right? Father Christmas, this big, portentous, powerful man, they're watching it upstairs. I love the way they cast the line in which in the wardrobe. How many of you have seen Braveheart? Remember Hamish, the guy with the red beard who loved hitting Mel Gibson in the face? <laughs> Mel Gibson could use a little sense, I wish Hamish would hit him again. <laughs> Hamish's father, you remember that old warrior, the big old tough warrior, and then he gets like hit with a spear and he breaks it off and he beats the snot out of the guy who hit him with the spear. That guy, Hamish's dad, that's Father Christmas in the line in that kind of power and the waiting for Christmas. And remember what Lewis, how Lewis describes him? He had his uh, eyes were bright, bright as holly berries. Hmm. How about a long expected party, to quote the Hobbit? A long awaited visit, right? Hope for all of these things. A delicious meal for heaven's sake. Because what is the Holy Eucharist if not a tiny little meal of grape juice and crackers that points to the marriage feast of the Lamb? 
a wedding feast. And, speaking of marriage, it occurs to me that it is high time that we talk about love. <laughs> C.S. Lewis, quite simply and without any exaggeration, taught me everything I know about love. <laughs> He says that love is how we go out of ourselves to meet someone else. Mm -hmm. How we go out of ourselves to meet somebody else. The fundamental move of love is a humble move, a humbling move. To think the very best you can of somebody else and to do the best you can for them. It's essentially self-abandonment any time we can even come close to doing it. Lewis wrote an inimitable book, the most important book that I've ever read as an adult. I recommend it highly to you. It's called The Four Loves. I know the five love languages, but Gary Chapman and I both know the four loves. There are a few surviving recordings uh, of Lewis's voice, and one is the lectures in 1958 that became this book, The Four Loves, in 1960. He starts out, In Greek there are four words for love. Storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, means affection. <coughs> Almost anyone, it seems, could be the objects of storge. The ugly, the stupid, even the exasperating can be on its receiving end. <laughs> Storgi, you may not have heard of. Eros, we've heard way too much of. <laughs> Philia, we haven't heard enough of. And you know about agape, or as the British pronounce it, agape. Which, by the way, was a very little used word. Christians came in, grabbed agape out of Greek, and turned it into love is patient, love is kind. That's that word. Good for us. <laughs> Storgi is the love of family members. How many of you have family members who you love but don't like? <laughs> okay, your counseling department has plenty to work on. <laughs> Storgi is family love. Storgi is patriot love. Storgi is accidental love. I hope Ryan Hoyer can do it. Glad <laughs> <laughs> Fitzpatrick is gone. I learned a whole lot about Storgi when I led a children's retreat. I was talking about football, for those of you who don't care. Um, I learned a whole lot about Texas and a whole lot about Storgi the first time I led a children's retreat here in Texas at Camp Allen. These little boys were talking, and they're like seven or eight-year-old kids, and they started having an argument about who was better, Aggies or Longhorns. <laughs> the vitriol! The violence! The, we got any angry Aggies in the room? I mean, okay, do you have any Longhorns in the room? Yes, our cheer when we would play either of y'all. I did my master's over here, right, so... Uh, our cheer was, that's all right, that's okay, you're going to work for us someday. <laughs> Got any owls in the room? No owls, I'm the only one. Let me see if I can make it out alive. <laughs> What's that? That's what hope's for. I hope I can. I won't tell you the joke that we used to tell about Aggies there, right? I can't be persuaded. I, mean, I won't do it. <laughs> Storgi, it's accidental love. These little kids loved College Station. These little kids loved Austin. They loved Burn Orange. They loved uh, Crimson and White. Maroon and White. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Maroon and White. Forgive me, Aggies. Because they were born here in Texas, and their parents were born here in Texas. Oh, I have a friend who's a Longhorn, and she and her husband sent up some dirt from Texas up to Oklahoma to put underneath the hospital bed where their grandson was born. They wanted him to be born over the soil of Texas. <laughs> I see some young couples taking notes. <laughs> Who says it's better to be an Aggie? All right, it's all right. Who says it's better to be a Longhorn? Who says I don't care, I'm just glad I'm a Texan? <laughs> I grew 
pick my nose. And I loved being the Southland in my favorite season. When God made me a Yankee, he was only teasing. <laughs> <laughs> There's something very accidental about our sports affinities. They have a whole lot to do with geography and where we happen to be born. Storky is the love that we happen to chance upon. Have you ever been at a going away party for somebody that you didn't particularly like all that well? <laughs> somebody you were pretty glad were going? <laughs> but there was probably a moment at which you went, oh, I'll never see that person again. A little pang before you came to your senses and went like, cool. <laughs> but before that, the little pang of, I'll never see this person again alive, ever. That's storky. It happens in families. Mothers in the room? Do we care if they have 17 feet or purple hair? When they're born. <laughs> purple hair is a teenager we can do something about. Do we care what they look like? No, they came out of you. They belong to you. You will fiercely defend them. That's story. You don't care whether or not they're brown hair or blonde. Blue eyes or green. They're yours. They belong to you. There is a kinship. It is, in some ways, accidental, meaning you didn't have anything to do with it. Put it to you another way. Have you ever traveled in Europe in a foreign country where they are speaking a language that you didn't speak? Is that not exhausting? <laughs> and don't you wish they would just talk right? <laughs> and then, after days upon days of not hearing your native tongue, somebody in a cafe speaks English. You make a beeline, right? I don't care if they're from New Zealand or whatever. I mean, they're Kiwi. I don't. You make a beeline, and you start talking with them, and it's so nice to talk English with them. You probably exchange contact information and never get a hold of them again. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Better if they're from America. Better still if they're from Texas. Better still if they're from Houston. There's more of that story, more of that accidental affinity. But unless there's something else to bind you together, that's as far as that, that love goes. It stops at the water's edge. Don't get me wrong, though. Storgi, according to Lewis, is responsible for nine-tenths of whatever solid and durable happiness there is in our natural lives. Affection, Storgi, almost slinks or seeps through our lives. It lives with humble, undress, private things, soft slippers, old clothes, old jokes, the thump of a sleepy dog's tail on the kitchen floor, the sound of the sewing machine, a child's toy left on the lawn. My aunt inherited my grandma and grandfather's house, and they built up really big. They're in, you know, Hope Sound, and so they're going to build up real big. They're across the street from the ocean. But there's their little parlor in the front, and when you open it up, it smells just like grandma and grandpa's old house. That smell that is unique to them. When I got my great aunt's books after she passed away, they smelled like her. And how I lamented when they didn't smell that way anymore. Story. And a little hope. Okay? Family affection. You don't choose it. Philia. Friendship. The classic position of friends is shoulder to shoulder. Two friends standing shoulder to shoulder, looking at the same thing the same way. <sighs> Friendship arises, Lewis says, out of mere companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest or even taste which the others do not share and which, till that moment, each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. The typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. I love all of my colleagues. One of my colleagues loves Dorothy Sayers. I love Dorothy Sayers. I don't know enough of her, but I, I love her, because Jack loved her, and you know, there it is. Another of my colleagues is a big Tolkien person. She teaches Spanish, and man, we could go talk Tolkien for hours. Another of my colleague lo colleagues loves Chesterton. 
I was away from my best friend uh, for years, uh, and then I came back to California for a visit, and as Eddie and I sat in the living room talking about our favorite songs and the favorite guitar solos on the, you know, our favorite songs on our favorite albums, his wife walked through the room and said, all you guys ever do is talk about music. <laughs> We're like, duh. <laughs> That's the good stuff! Friendship is born out of a shared interest. Now, it can be quilting, it can be NASCAR, it can be Lewis, it can be rock collecting. People get as, I mean, have you watched Pawn Stars? <laughs> oh my gosh, people are obsessed with lots of different things. It could be UFOs, whatever. If somebody likes the very right part of the very right thing, there's the potential for friendship. And you know what friends do? They separate from the crowd. How many of you have work friends? They're only friends if you will keep in touch with them in 10 years because of the kinds of things they love. I worked in a restaurant in California with a couple hundred people in the six years I was there. I'm in touch with one guy. How many of you are in touch with fewer than 50 people from high school? <laughs> high school, Storgy, the people you still are in touch with, not just because they added you on Facebook, but because you like go do stuff. That's friendship. Okay. It's separating from the crowd, not to be exclusive, but so that you won't be rude. You know that your obsession with NASCAR, or C.S. Lewis, or quilting, or whatever it is. You know that that's kind of weird, but when somebody else likes it in the same way, or even better yet, when they like it in exactly the wrong way. <laughs> I have a friend who says, I love the White Witch, man. She that's scares me. Why <laughs> You're crazy! <laughs> but you know Narnia is important. Come on, let's fight about it. C.S. <laughs> Lewis says, when one has read a book, I find there's nothing so nice as discussing it with somebody else who's read it, even though it tends to produce rather fierce arguments. <laughs> and I say, because they do. Friendship. And this is why men and women are generally not friends. Lewis says, unless they are otherwhere loved or mutually repulsed by the side of each other, Men and women are generally not friends. Okay? It's, and I see this all the time in teaching teenagers. Are you guys going, oh, no, we're just friends. <laughs> just friends is a key indication that they have never really had many friendships. Because if you have had a good and true and abiding friendship, you would never attach a word like just to it. The solid bedrock love of my entire life are my friends. And I'm getting the better part of the deal. Friends separate from the crowd, love the same things the same way, and because you can trust them with your records or your books or your rock collection or whatever it is, if you can trust them with the thing that you love the most, maybe you can trust them with the intimate details of your lives. Friends don't start out sharing intimacy. <laughs> they start out looking at the same thing the same way. Does that help? This helps draw some boundaries for me, and that's why my best friends are different from some of my family members. My brother used to ask me to hear a quarter of what I would tell Eddie and Barry. In perfect friendship, this appreciative love is, I think, often so great and so firmly based that each member of the circle feels in his secret heart humbled before all the rest. Sometimes he wonders what he is doing there among his betters. He is lucky beyond dessert to be in such company, especially when the whole group is together, each bringing out all that is best, wisest, or funniest in all the others. These are golden sessions where four or five of us, after a hard day's walking, have come to our inn when our slippers are on, our feet spread out towards the blaze, when the whole world and something beyond the world opens itself to our minds as we talk. And no one has any claim on or responsibility for another, but all are free and equals as if we had first met an hour ago, while at the same time an affection mellowed by the years enfolds us. <coughs> life, natural life, has no better gift to give. Who could have deserved it? After friends have been hanging out for a while, that familial kind of storgy grows up. Uh, Chesterton calls it the slow maturing of old jokes. <laughs> you know about the cowboys that sat around the campfire for so many years that they numbered their jokes? 
first old boy says, well, fellas, I got one for you, number 17. <laughs> well, if you think that's good, 38. Wow! <laughs> go crazy. Third old boy says, yep, but you know what? 67. Dead silence. First old boy says the second old boy. He never did know how to tell jokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's affection working with philia, working with friendship. Friends always make me feel as though I was getting the better part of the deal. Yeah. And a friendship will separate from the crowd, but will welcome a third and a fourth and a fifth. Heartbreakingly, in The Four Loves, Lewis says, now that Charles Williams is gone, I don't have more of Tolkien, I have less of him. I will never see that particularly Williams Williamsian expression on Ronald Tolkien's face. Friends grow exponentially. You want another one to talk about that secret passion. You want to feel not alone. <coughs> Friendship does this inestimably. <coughs> oh, Eros. If friends are shoulder to shoulder, lovers are face to face. They also separate from the crowd, but a third or a fourth or a fifth would not be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> friends want to talk about the thing. Lovers want to talk about each other. That's what Lewis says, and this is after he finally got married. It has two dangers when you take it too seriously. It has the possibility of becoming almost godlike. When you have that relationship and all that it feels like, emotionally and physically and all these other ways, who needs anything more than that? The job of the lovers, the job of the husband and wife is to get up and go to church <laughs> to make sure that they are taking their love to the true source of their love. The other, uh, the other danger of romantic love, erotic love, is that it takes itself way too seriously. And our culture, finding that it can profit from selling advertisements, has expanded the sexual to the point of ridiculousness. Venus is a comic spirit. Lewis says, we have reached the stage at which nothing is more needed than a roar of old-fashioned laughter. Face it, bodies are ridiculous. <laughs> the naked body is hilarious. <laughs> Lewis says that the body is the oldest joke in the world. And if you don't believe it, get a room of eight-year-olds, I will teach you how to slay as a comedian. Get a room of eight-year-olds and say... I tweeted. <laughs> They're on the floor. The body is hilarious. If you don't know how ridiculous you are, we do. <laughs> That's part of why the erotic spirit, the romantic spirit, Venus, is also hilarious. But our society desensitizes us from the ridiculousness of that so they can sell us stuff. Axe deodorant and all the rest of it. <laughs> Eros also allows us to get nearer to God than any other love. I frankly cannot feel like God is my daddy, which is what Abba means. Sometimes in a great moment, but it's too amorphous. He's too, I don't know, other for that. I certainly don't think that Jesus is my pal, but I do feel him washing me away and overwhelming my heart in worship. It leaves my heart pounding like a lover. And nothing on this earth short of the oceanic pull of falling in love furnishes a standard of comparison to the love of God, which is why we are the bride of Christ. He used arrows as the greatest metaphor for his love for us, because nothing consumes as much as that. It's not too far different. We have a worship band at my school that is stunning, breathtaking. I cannot keep a dry eye. And the only other feeling that encapsulates me even close to that is romantic 
falling in love. It incorporates all. You feel like you have to physically respond. I don't feel like I gotta physically respond to my buddy and I punch him in the arm once a month or something. <laughs> and that's why we are the bride of Christ. That's why all the saints and the mystics talk about the romance of God. Read your Saint John of the Cross. Right? Read, um, read your medieval mystics. Agape. You probably know this being well taught here. I know your pastors, they're doing a great job, I am sure. Agape, you know, agape, divine love, is a decision. It is not a feeling. I sometimes wish that 1 Corinthians was not read at weddings because you only get there only seldom. Can I get an amen, married couple? <laughs> Aim for it all the time. Get there sometimes in our best moments. Love is patient. Not me. Yeah. Kind. Don't I wish. Right. Keeps no record of wrongs. How you doing on that one? <laughs> Married couples. Agape is not a feeling. It is a choice. It is a verb. It is something I decide to do, especially when I don't feel like it. Remember Lewis's initial decision or initial description. Love is where I go out of myself to meet somebody else. Right? Agape is the only way God loves us, because all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's what Isaiah says. Our sins are scarlet. You know, we'll be washed whiter than snow. We don't have anything to offer our offer to God. He can only love us because he decided to. We can get all prettied up and be nice for a day, but that's about how long it's going to last. We can't make him love us. He just loves because he chooses to. There's no accounting for taste. It's always a choice, this agape love. He exults over us with singing. This steadfast love never ceases. He is close to the broken heart. Mark 10, the rich young ruler... Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then said the hardest thing that he could ever say. And the man's face fell because he was a great wealth. Sometimes love will say the hardest thing that it can ever say. Jesus looks at him and in him, us in all of our weakness and ridiculousness. The love of God is unconditional. We get there sometimes. He's there always. And now we come down to it. How can we even swallow this great foundational fact of all the universe, of, of everything Lewis ever wrote? I was with Lewis's stepson in the kilns a couple of years ago, mentioned the book that I'm working on about love, and he said, eh, which I think is the overarching underlying theme of everything Lewis wrote, and Doug said, you're the only one who I know who's noticed that all of Lewis's books are about love. A man can no more diminish God's glory, Lewis says, by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. But God wills our good, and our good is to love him with that responsive love proper to creatures. And to love him, we must know him. And if we know him, we shall, in fact, fall on our faces. If we do not, that only shows that what we are trying to love is not yet God, though it may be the nearest approximation to God which our thought and fantasy can attain. We are bidden to put on Christ, to become like God. That is, whether we like it or not, God intends to give us what we need, not what we now think we want. Once more, we are embarrassed by the intolerable compliment by too much love, not too little. The problem for me is not paying enough attention to the fact that God loves me, sees me, does not sleep. If he really does rejoice over me with singing, and, he, and he that, that watcheth over Israel neither slumbereth nor sleepeth. If that's really true, if both of those are true, God must stand over your bed all night long making up little songs. 
This is done. Such a weak little Imagine the angels. Watch, he's going to roll over again. I love it when he does that. First time parents, remember first time parents when you went in there just to check if they were breathing all night long and then you watched them breathe? Isn't it cute? He breathes. <laughs> If God exalts over us with singing, he must be standing beside your bed, singing over you in love. Not love ignorant of what you've done, love because of what you've done, and receiving the gift of his hard, uh, of his arms of love stretched out upon the hard wood of the cross. You do the deal, you are his forever so that all may come within the saving embrace, the Book of Common Prayer says. He loves you. He decided to, and he doesn't go back on that. It's the intolerable compliment. But it's not merely enough to wonder at the love of God. We have to do something about it. Lewis, I love because he puts us in this pivot. What I believe must turn into action. You want to know how to figure out whether faith without works and the whole faith versus works and the James and the Paul and the James and the Paul. You want to know how to do that? Read C.S. Lewis. Because the moment he believes something, he does something about it. The moment you believe something, you must also do something about it. You must witness to the wonder. What's the wonder? That God could see you and love you. That must be the central reality in all the world. If it isn't, go home. Don't come back on Sunday. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts, expressed by the cross, the greatest undergoing the cruelest for the sake of the least worthy. This backwards, upside down, intolerable truth. That must be the truth. If not, we are of all men to be pitied, Paul says. In conclusion, will you forgive me for closing where I closed last time with the ending words of mere Christianity? I can't tell you how often I need these words. Give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose your life, and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions, and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ. And you will find him, and with him, everything else thrown in. So what do you do? Die to yourself. It's the perfect command this Lenten season as we lurch towards Easter. This season during which so much of the church thinks about the mortification of the flesh, the ways in which we carry around in our bodies the death of Christ. Die to yourself. But as you do, keep a weather eye open for the garden at the grave, tending to early springtime flowers. And when you meet him too, and he calls you by name, go, run, bear witness to this wonder. Run full speed to those who hide, cowering in upper rooms, full of fear, full of themselves. And bring news, both the news of the empty tomb and news, tomb and news of your full full heart. Let them smell the sweetness of the virtues all around you. Let your face glow like Moses come from the mountain, eyes shining, seeing the hindmost parts of God. 
run to this dark world in need and bring with you faith fully engaged, hope of heaven lifting your heart to the Lord and love that intolerable compliment, that thing that we need most, the love that never fails nor fades away. And listen again to the voice of Lewis calling from the chorus of the great cloud of witnesses, urging us to take up that song, that great and glad hymn of the everlasting throng, and go into this wide and weary world and bear witness to the wonder of the faith and the hope and the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. tonight if you would like